Well, hello everyone. I'm Gene Trowbridge of the law firm Trowbridge and Ney, and uh, we're securities lawyers. So what we do is we write uh, private placement memorandums and all the documents if you're going to raise money from a group of people to buy something or do a business and uh, that turns into the world of securities law. And so that's what we do. And in this in this series of interviews that I'm doing, I'm talking to people I know who are very active in spaces as alternatives to multifamily. Uh, many of you follow me and you know that there's a lot of multifamily offerings going on out there. But in this series of interviews, I want to talk to people who, who do something else because I am seeing some of my clients move from multifamily to other other product types and so I thought I would do this and today we're lucky to have uh, one of the foremost speakers on uh, self-storage Mr. Scott Myers out of uh, Indianapolis we were just talking about the race a few minutes ago well Scott welcome and thank you very much for taking your time to be on TNL Talks. Of course Gene good to see you again thanks for having me. You're, you're welcome. So we've just got four questions. We're going to go through this. Uh, uh, tell us about your syndication company, would you, Scott? Sure. Well, you know, our, our syndication company really just kind of organically grew into a syndication company out of the fact that you know, we needed more capital if we were going to be able to grow. And if you're in commercial real estate with more commas and zeros are required, I think uh, everybody gets to that place. And, you know, before we knew it, Gene, I think um, we became a financial services company that deployed capital in real estate. And and I don't know exactly when that happened, but all of a sudden we woke up and recognized that all of our efforts and the things that we were doing, the daily tasks and responsibilities were all about the capital side and not that it wasn't important, the asset side and the investment side wasn't important, uh, but the more important piece was handling the syndication company. And so it was born out of, again, the, the need to gather more folks, um, the, the friends and family money where we started in the syndication side. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if you remember, um, Gene, but you were with us at the very beginning of that um, from buying your, your software and uh, the valuation to running through you know, setting things up and then uh, running through the analysis and making sure that we knew exactly how to calculate an IRR to present it to our folks, but um, that, that brought on a whole new skill set. Um, and, and it turns out that, you know, that was the piece that is the piece that I still love the most. And, I, and it turns out, uh, I believe that uh, is, is probably the best place for me in our organization is not to, because we never, we never sell anybody on what we're doing um, or persuade, but just helping them make a uh, uh, driving them to a natural conclusion that if this is right for them and it makes sense the if they're comfortable with the the asset class being self storage what we invest in our organization and then myself then you know it's natural if they have dollars that they want to invest that they should be investing out with us and and i think i've got a uh, over over the years um have a knack for being able to allow people to realize that and and that has uh, allowed us to be able to grow and so now i lead an organization where yeah, we, we bring on folks to invest in self-storage. We have our, the, uh, our portal, our investor relations folks, um, and a whole staff of support people that, um, you know, was kind of fun in building. Uh, it allowed us uh, to, allowed me to stretch and, and build another organization on top of the investing side of the business. And now I spend more of my time really focusing on the private equity side than I really do on the asset side of the business. You know, when I had my first series of interviews, with uh, I think it was 37 of my clients. The first question was, how did you get into the syndication business? And why I didn't at, while I didn't ask you that question, you gave me the same answer, <laughs> the same answer that they gave every time and that I gave when I got into the syndication business is mm -hmm. I found a piece of property that I didn't have all the capital for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I had to go out and, and, and I don't, use the word sell. And I noticed in your presentation, you didn't use the word sell. I kind of mm -hmm. think that people know that we're okay and we find opportunities. And then mm -hmm. if we can present those opportunities to people and it fits, they'll invest with us. It isn't so much mm -hmm. selling, it's explaining the opportunity. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. I, I, I do, um, you know, because um, as you're raising capital, you you recognize that a, a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. And and if you're trying to sell something, they're still not going to buy. <laughs> so they're, if there's something in, in your project or something they don't see or understand, you know, to use another uh, adage, a confused mind says no. 
um, you know, we, we, what we've done is, you know, we stay very disciplined in our approach to investing. And so if we plot along and show them the path to profitability, because it makes sense because of the project that we have and our track record and our experience and that, that, you know, over the years, if you continue to do this for a number of years and you actually do what you say you're going to do and that what you return to your investors actually um, meets or exceeds the projections that you started with, you know, three, four, five years earlier, that um, becomes a much easier to raise capital. But uh, it, it just is a is a process, if you will, of just uh, walking people through the reasons why this investment makes sense. Because by the way, I have skin in the game and, and I have time that I'm expending and efforts and resources that if I'm not going to get a return, then, you know, there's no sense in doing this and neither should you here's your portion of what you're going to get as a return and, and, in, and here's mine and we're in this uh, together. And so I, I think the the best way to be able to show that to people is, um, again, over the years, it's through our track record, but in the beginning, it's um, just drawing them to a logical conclusion that um, there isn't anything that we say that isn't very simple to be able for them to be able to understand and for them to truly believe that you know what we're showing and presenting uh, just makes sense um, beyond our track record um, uh, is that it's just uh, something that they can understand, but they're just, they couldn't, uh, they don't want to, or or they wouldn't go out and do this and invest on their own. But um, they're they're happy to come alongside of us uh, because they're passionate about it and they can see that this uh, this deal makes sense or this fund makes sense. When I started in the the, the syndication business and and started doing my self storage, there still was a feeling that a self storage project was a land banking mm -hmm. uh, yeah position, like a drive in movie. Driving mm -hmm. movie theater was land banking, and the industry has certainly changed. Mm -hmm. Change from that. These are viable, valuable assets. Uh, what mm -hmm. drove you to self storage as opposed to the other uh, asset classes available to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think like most investors, I was investing in a single family houses. And then I got to the place where, you know, you really need to have, um, you need to grow very quickly if you're going to have a, a buy and hold strategy. And that's that's what we had started out doing is um, I wanted to have a number of properties that was producing cash flow and then the ability to um, sell off as a group at, at some point, um, or just to be able to have the you know, the steady cash flow to be able to well, do what I want when I wanted and grow an organization that way. And then we find out that in the, uh, you know, in the habitational real estate business where you do have uh, tenants and toilets and trash, that um, it is a working business. It's not a set it and forget it. It is not a mailbox uh, business. And that truly to get to that place where you can focus on growing your business rather than working in your business you know, that requires a critical mass and so, and some economies of scale. And so that's when we got into multifamily and uh, sort of buying multifamily apartment complexes um, throughout central Indiana and hiring management companies and then staff to maybe actually oversee either an individual asset or, or oversee the management companies. But at the end of the day, Gene, that was just, I don't think I was cut out for that. I, um, I still got disappointed in my, my fellow man when they would destroy our properties and and not pay us, um, you know, to me that was stealing, and and that was just um, <laughs> um, that was just a bad stewardship of uh, this asset that we um, provided to them for for housing, and I and I just um, I got really tired of having to clean up all those messes and write checks for them as well, but in real estate and rental real estate, if you want somebody to pay down your basis then you know there's there without tenants and toilets there's well parking lots and self storage you know and maybe a couple of others but you can't really grow you know the value of a parking garage or a vacant piece of land unless you begin to improve it and you know have ancillary income streams on top of it and so that led me to self storage and when i began to look into the asset class you know, if somebody doesn't pay, you know, you, you lock them out. We put a lock on their unit. And because it's not habitation real estate, we have a different set of laws. They're called lien laws. If they don't pay us, we lock them out and then we sell their stuff off and recoup our money. So I thought, well, that'd have been great if I could do that in apartments or houses, except it's illegal. You can't. Um, and then when they leave, um, whether it's on their own accord or if we do have, actually have to go through an auction process, so no matter what, when I, when I get back is a metal box on a concrete slab. Yeah. And so you know, we blow it out. Um, we maybe wipe down the doors and in our turn is maybe five minutes, whereas, you know, it's five to six weeks with our apartments and our houses to, to clean carpets, replace carpet, paint, you know, interview and get the right person in line 
um, you know, for that unit and, and have, you know, this lag time and the, you know, the vacancy, the economic vacancy was huge in habitational real estate compared to self-storage where you just move people in right after another because your marketing and that machine is on all the time. And so those were the, uh, I think some of the key indicators is that, um, you know, it wasn't, um, it, it's not a high lift, heavy touch management intensive business. And, and, and basically the laws are set up to benefit the investor, not the tenant. So one, once I, um, you know, I saw the light, if you will, then that's when we began selling off our houses and our apartments. And then uh, we became full-time investors in self-storage and I only own one house um, free and clear. And that's the one that I live in and everything else is uh, self-storage. That's our, our entire portfolio over 4 million square feet now, um, over 26,000 units nationwide is nothing but storage. Isn't that great? I always say that uh, a self-storage project is great because you've got 800 units, one toilet, and mm -hmm. most of the time, you don't have anyone sleeping there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yep. That sums it up. <laughs> you always, I, I'll tell you one story I had. I had a a project up in, um, oh, Barstow, which is about mm -hmm. 50 or 200 miles away from where I live. And I had, on a 4th of July, I had run a, I had run a 10K, and I was actually mm -hmm. sitting in the bathtub, uh, uh trying to calm down my legs and my mm -hmm. wife came in with the telephone and she said here it's the uh the sheriff of barstow mm -hmm. i said okay hi good morning hey mm -hmm. you know we uh we found a guy at a bar the other night who had a wad of cash in his pocket and no identification on it but he had a rent mm -hmm. receipt mm -hmm. that said he had paid you 36 dollars for renting Mm -hmm. his unit, and we think he's a drug dealer and we want to get in there yeah and i said well it's the fourth of july you know do you have a warrant no mm -hmm. i thought you'd cooperate with us and i said i will tomorrow mm -hmm. morning on the fifth mm -hmm. my manager will be there mm -hmm. with his lock cutter and you bring a warrant and we'll we'll get mm -hmm. There and sure as hell, he was cooking meth in uh, oh man units, which is quite was quite risky for us, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it isn't it isn't totally uh, totally devoid of problems with uh, with tenants. A couple of questions: mm -hmm. How's the financing on uh, self storage units today? Yeah. Uh, and that was another one of the reasons why we love self storage is because um, it is a very recession resistant, as you know, um, when we're in the trauma and transition business and when people are downsizing and businesses are downsizing, um, that's when people need storage. If they have a flood in their basement um, needs to be you know, gutted and cleaned out, um, that, well, they're going to move stuff into storage until it is uh, done or if they're going to remodel, whether it's something they elect to do. You know, if people are moving, um, regardless of what's happening, businesses that are downsizing, they're putting inventory into storage, inexpensive uh, warehousing space, which is what we uh, offer um, until things turn back around again. Um, we benefit from that. Also, when things are going well in the economy, people you know, need more stuff. Um, they feel they need more stuff and they run out of room for it. That's what self-storage provides. Um, we also provide for drop shippers, Amazon drop shippers and uh, online uh, folks that are selling goods and uh, items. You know, we're a great place to start a business if they're running it out of their uh, kitchen or out of start uh, and they need a place for their inventory. You know, we provide a lot of that last mile warehousing in a, in a small fashion uh, as well. And so for that reason, you know, self-storage uh, has always historically done very, very well during a recession and also very well during a uh, boom times. And so, you know, lenders, um, you know, they they take it in the shorts, um, you know, when the economy goes bad and people begin defaulting on uh, loans and mortgages, um, valuations of houses go down, valuations of multifamily. We, we all know historically it just tanks during a recession. And, you know, all these other asset classes get uh, affected negatively, whereas self-storage actually um, goes in a positive direction. So when banks want to strengthen their balance sheet, you know, they do it with self-storage. And so we have no shortage of lenders that want to have self-storage on their balance sheets, which means gives us loans. Um, they're, they're lending on the asset class. And obviously the owners and the operators, not not really so much a personal guarantee, at least at the level that we're at, um, but it, it is just, a, it, it truly is much easier, Gene, to get a, a loan on a self-storage facility than a, a first time, say a first time operator who is going, taking the leap from single family up into a multifamily or assisted living or hospitality or mobile home parks, because um, again, those are all negatively affected as we head into a next economic cycle. Mm -hmm. 
and you're probably borrowing from banks, whether they're regional or national banks. Uh, that's your source of financing, right? We do. We do um, community banks, local banks, savings and loans that want to look under the hood uh, of a facility and know that it's in their backyard to the regional banks and then uh, also the SBA national lenders. And uh, and then, of course, with our uh, the private equity side, uh, we also have some folks that are coming in, not only layering on top of that, but we also have some private equity folks that are coming in on the debt side from international money. That's uh, seeing how well self storage is done in the U.S. and and they are investing in, in place of the lenders who are getting very favorable rates and uh, flexibility that we're seeing um, that we've never seen before from foreign investors that are um, pouring money into self storage right now. Okay, and the benefits to uh, to a passive investor mm-hmm. in self storage. What would you uh, identify those as? Well, the, the way that we set up ours, which is um, a very similar to most, is that um, they become equity partners. And so they get a chunk of the equity and ownership and shares of the LLC, which means that they share in the profits. They share in the cash flow. They share in the profits upon a sale. But then they also benefit from the, the depreciation that passes through as well. So if they're investing outside of a self-directed uh, investment vehicle, then they get the depreciation uh, as well. So that, along with um, again enjoying uh, the benefits of investing in self storage versus the other asset classes, uh, that steady cash flow um, that we have, we pay distributions on a quarterly basis, and uh, being able to just uh, the, the reporting structures that we have uh, put in place is uh, usually providing nothing but good news uh, quarter over quarter. And um, for us personally, we we treat this you know we have an education company, but we also treat our limited partners, our equity partners. Um, as if they're coming along on this journey with us because they are. And uh, we have webinars and uh, they can ask questions and we show them the business model that being um, played out as we continue to walk through exactly what we said we would do in the very beginning. So um, I think many, many benefits of investing in this and, and from our side and our organization, uh, we, we go the next uh, the, the extra step and, and, and go the next mile for our investors to truly make them feel as if they're partners and come alongside of us. Sure, that's... Uh... That's terrific. When I was in the storage business, we always we built units and mm-hmm. we built a manager's unit on the property. Mm-hmm. We had uh, security around it and we had a computer system for everything. Mm-hmm. Is the manager unit still uh, a requirement in self-storage? You know, that's interesting, Gene. Um, I, I think the the industry has evolved and for you know one of the REITs that you used to sell to that had always been their business model is to have a manager on site um you you put 50 self storage owner operators in a, a room and 25 of them will say we love having resident managers on on site and uh, the other 25 will say we would never um have resident managers on site and i and i'm of the uh, i'm in that camp where uh, i'm not a big fan i i understand the pros and cons but when you you list them um, first of all, if you're going to hire somebody and their requirement is to live on site, that limits your pool of rock star operators that are going to come in. You know, if they have to live at a self storage facility, that's you're not going to be in the top of list of um, things that people really want to do. And if they don't perform well, well, then not only do you have an eviction on your hands, um, uh, along with the termination, um, but that can be very messy. You know, in terms of uh, parting and you know that relationship. Um, with having both a you know a termination from an employer as well as a, a an eviction as well, and and also at the end of the day, conversely, to look at um, the fact that you know I'm hiring somebody to manage and drive the performance of my one million, two million, ten million, twenty million dollar asset. Um, is this somebody that is going to want to live at a self storage facility? And and what kind of caliber is that person who is truly driving the performance of this asset for myself and my investors? And um, that they're willing to just sell their house or that they're in a position to just say, yeah, if I hire you next week, can you move into the self-storage facility? Say, well, heck yeah, I'm, you know, I'm living under the bridge right now. And so that'll be no problem. <laughs> what, what kind of caliber of person are you going to get? Um, and again, this is my opinion to be able to go and um, move into a, an apartment or a house that is on, uh, on site. I just think that there's, there's a lot of limitations being placed on it. Um, by um, forcing that as part of the job description. Conversely, if somebody's living on site, well, you know what? They're probably recognize uh, it's going to go with the job that um, even though the gate's locked and 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 the lights are shut off, that there may be people honking horns and maybe throwing rocks at your window if they can uh, find out where you are. Um, if they're always on 24-7, they're just going to get burnt out and, uh, and they may leave. So even if they are a rock star and they agreed to live on site, um, I think um, you know, living at a self-storage facility and heaven forbid you want to... Um, 
you know, catch a wife or a husband and raise kids. I don't think you're going to want to, to do it inside the walls of a, um, uh, a self-storage facility. So that's uh, that's my take. In our facilities, which were all in Southern California through the three mm-hmm. county areas, we were concentrating back then, and this was in the early 80s, on uh, uh, retired uh, military couples. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There is no shortage of those out here. Right, you know, right. Exactly. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I'm in an experience now where I'm in a, in a storage facility. I've probably been there six years. And mm-hmm. when I rented, I walked into the office and talked to the person who was upstairs and came down mm-hmm. and did all mm-hmm. that. Now, there's never anyone on site. Mm-hmm. Everything mm-hmm. can be done electronically. Mm-hmm. And it does, it hasn't bothered me yet, but I've watched the uh, the transformation of that. Mm-hmm. I don't think mm-hmm. there's anything uh, negative about the, uh, the mm-hmm. facility be- because mm-hmm. of that. So, yeah, you know, one thing you talked about is uh, the more you get into it and you're already there, the more this whole business of being a syndicator is a people business dealing with your, Mm -hmm. your investors. I mean, you can, Mm -hmm. you can have on-site managers, off-site managers, you can do Mm -hmm. whatever you want. You can buy properties 2000 miles away from your home, but your investors still think you have their money. (laughs) <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they want to visit their money periodically. If anything goes yeah. mm-hmm. awry in their life, they are going to contact you. So that mm-hmm. back in the early 80s, well, it wasn't really the early 80s. I guess it was 93 or 94 when I left. I left the business. There were no platforms. Um, there were no uh things like you have your back office mm-hmm. or there were no mm-hmm. third party platforms. And mm-hmm. I, I know I sent out 2000 K ones one year mm-hmm. ourself. And, mm-hmm. um, oh, I just decided that that management of that number of investors and all that was only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And if I'd been smart, I would have mm-hmm. started one of these platforms to, uh, Mm-hmm. have other people hire me to take care of the, the background, but I didn't. So mm-hmm. I went off to law school. I wanted to stay in the industry. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so when I went to law school, the only thing I wanted to do was be a securities attorney. And that's, and that's what worked. So that's very, very interesting. And I appreciate your time. Uh, one mm-hmm. last thing I'd like you to be able to do is I'd mm-hmm. like to be able to ex- you to explain the educational tools that mm-hmm. you have that are uh, available to uh, people who might be listening to the podcast. Sure. Well, you know, Gene, uh, we've been at this uh, for quite a while now. And, um, you know, I, I walked into a room recently and um, somebody said, hey, there's Scott Myers. It's the OG of self-storage. And um, and I guess I recognize that, uh, you know, we were the first to create an educational platform for self-storage. And now, you know, when I walk around the trade shows and the conferences, um, it's good to see that the you know the kids have all grown up and um, some of the folks that we helped to get into the business um, you know 17, 18 years ago, ever since we've been teaching people about this and, and the vast amount of people that we've uh, taught how to get into the business, um, there's a fair there's a large percentage um, in the industry that have come through our organization and through our self storage academies and uh, received uh, consulting and uh, mentoring and assistance uh, along the way. And so in the beginning, it just started with a, a home study system to, that was just a it was a it was a business plan on steroids that had everything mapped out and how you go about finding, evaluating, purchasing, and managing self storage facilities. I mean, it, it it's to this day is still the gold standard. It is uh, the Bible for investing in uh, in self storage. And then along the way, we added on uh, mentoring and coaching and consulting, and uh, and that has allowed us to get into a number of uh, great partnerships with our students as well. And that's uh, that spawned then the syndication side where we do a lot of joint ventures um, in in our syndication projects. Uh, that included uh, then development, uh, which is how we uh, we grew as well. So we are we are all things uh, self storage. Uh, we teach people how to go out and uh, do anything and everything they want to do in self storage. Whether they're developers or looking to convert warehouses, it's a very first project. If they're looking to grow and scale, they can come into our mastermind, uh, which is um, also the nation's uh, oldest and the most vibrant and the largest self storage mastermind out there. Um, so any anything you're looking to do in self storage, um, you'll find it on our platform. So selfstorageinvesting.com. Uh, is our website uh, for all things self-storage to learn a little bit more about what we do and uh, to maybe uh, perhaps help you grow and scale your business or maybe even just uh, fill in some blind spots. 
All right. Well, that's great. I knew you'd have a good answer for that. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Once again, thanks, Scott. I appreciate the conversation on uh, self-storage. Uh, once again, this is Gene Trover, just part of our uh, Let's Talk process. If you have anything that you need to, to ask us, you can find us at our website, uh, which is tnllp.com, or you can go to Trowbridge Law. Uh, group.com that's the same and uh, call me and I'll uh, give you uh, some time I love to talk on the phone you can always get straight through to me and uh, Scott when we uh, publish this I'll, I'll let mm -hmm. you know it. maybe you can uh, send it off to uh, your listeners also fantastic you know we will Gene okay thanks again Scott I'll talk to you later all right take care